Carly, since you have the mic, and we are live, hello everybody, we're usually broadcasting a lot earlier in the day, so we're probably welcoming people from the opposite side of the world. Uh, it's their morning, and so hello everybody, probably from Indonesia, uh, we have some Indonesian fans, and we're here with Loyal Marymount students here, you guys are all seniors, and I'm happy to see you, so let's kick it off. What would you like to know? I mean, maybe from you personally, I, this is a person personal question yes I'm dealing with this dilemma of being an artist but also being a designer and maybe my question is do you think an artist can be a designer do you think a designer oh, a is an question. artist yeah so it's C so, so I don't know Carly Simon is it L-Y or L-I-E L-Y L-Y okay thank you Yes, and so you're, you're struggling with this idea of an artist and a designer. And how do you self-identify? Currently as an artist. Okay. And do you have definitions in your mind about what one is versus the other? I think one's a creator. I think one's a creator, artist. Okay, artist is the creator. And then a designer would be more of a visual communicator. The visual communicator. But I think both are problem solvers. Okay, so they have that in common? Both okay. are creative. Uh, problem solver, yes, both are I'd creative. Hope. Yeah, for sure. And I am agreeing with you so far, I think. Um, both are creative. Okay, what else? And you guys feel free to like jump in on this. Okay. I've struggled with the definition of artist for a really long time. I've always uh, d defined myself as a designer, and more specifically, a graphic designer. I've come to realize that the labels that we assign to ourselves can liberate us or it can imprison us in our own mind. And it's a really strange thing to think that a word can be so powerful, right? It can be really powerful. I'm watching this video of a hypnotherapist from the UK. I don't know her name right now, so I'm not gonna say it, but she says that the words you choose you guys have heard this before? The words you choose shape your reality. I don't know if you guys know this. And the more I'm learning about mindset stuff and psychotherapy, words are really, really powerful stuff. So she says, if you don't like your reality, all you have to do is change your words. And so words can, can anchor us, they can lift us up. And I was thinking about this because when I was seeing my therapist, she asked me this question. She likes to ask all her patients this question. She asked, what's the earliest memory that you have? And I told her, and she asked me, how old were you? And I said, I think I was three. And she goes, I like to ask everybody this. Do you want to know what the answers are? Usually, people have the earliest memory around two to three years old. And she told me then like, why she thought this was true. Because it's not that we don't know and have experiences between one and three. It's that around three is when we develop words and enough words to describe the world. And so that's it. Because the other parts are like, they're soft, they're feelings, they're impressions. But once we have words, we can describe this. And there are a lot of people in, in the world that start to think, and when you talk about uh, neuro-linguistic programming, when you talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, that these words are very powerful and they're linked to how we, we act, we behave, uh, our moods, whether or not we're happy or we're sad. So I'm only gonna take this tangent for a little bit. I'm gonna get right back to your question in a second, but words really are very powerful stuff. And so we wanna be more careful and more mindful and intentional in the words that we choose to describe things because the words shape how we feel, shape our memory, and then our emotions are all attached to that. Okay, so the word artist, I'm an artist, I'm a designer, I'm a graphic designer. All those things mean something. Now, I've struggled with the meaning of artist. When I was in college, I always thought that what these two types of people create on the outside look very similar. Especially today, the lines have blurred so much so that an illustrator is now a fine artist, a graphic designer is an artist because of the whole street art thing that's happened, right? The acceptance of what is art has changed. So what they do is they look similar. The output looks similar. So then what do we have to do? We have to look at the intention then, maybe. And in school, I, I was struggling with this. So I thought that an artist 
makes things to solve their own problem, whereas designers solve somebody else's problem. One has commerce attached to it, is a bit transactional, like I have a client, whereas one asks the questions and then answers. So then people get into then a designer answers and an artist asks questions, maybe. And then I was at a screening with the Wachowskis, the writers and the directors of The Matrix, one of my favorite films, and I forget which Wachowski said this, but uh, she said that art uh, is an invitation to share a person's point of view. That's all it is. So whether art is performance, sculptural, or painted, or, or photography, if you're inviting them to share your point of view in the world, I think it be becomes art, and the ones that do a great job are very successful. Somebody else also said that art is, I have a feeling about something, whatever that feeling is, and by the creation of this thing, I hope that you have a similar feeling. So we're sharing that. And I don't think I would describe that for designers necessarily. Designers like have a problem, here's the brief, we're very pragmatic, we look at things uh, through variables, we test ideas, and so that's where I see the boundaries of these two. The end product, the output to me, feels very similar. Okay. Now, I noticed while I was talking, Carly, you had a couple of different expressions on your face, things you may or may not agree with. So I would love to hear your thoughts, as this is meant to be a dialogue. Yeah, I think to riff off of what you're saying, artists, maybe, I don't always want to say always, but create things for themselves or from themselves. And I think that's where I struggle with when it's design. It's like I'm doing it for someone else. Yes. And it's like, where is that like passion and truth in that work? Not necessarily that I don't enjoy that, but I'm just like, I think I'm identifying more as an artist right now in my life because it's for me. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'd like to say this for everybody, uh, whether you're watching us or here with us live, which is I wish for every person here to have some point in their life where they feel like they are an artist. And, and to me, it's still very different. These words are very powerful, and I'm going to explain a little bit why. It's because a part of it is the motivation. Like, where does the motivation to create come from for the designer? I think the designer, I'm, not, I'm saying this in very broad strokes here, so I'm going to offend people already, that most designers, uh, I imagine, sit in a room, they're waiting for their next gig. That they're not necessarily um, just sitting there creating tons of logos or brochures randomly because, well, who wants that? And maybe they're doing drawings or experimenting on their own, and that's a separate thing. But they do that mostly to prepare for when the moment happens, when the phone rings, and then they solve somebody's problem. So the motivation is to solve other people's problem. Whereas the artist is, like, you, you can't stop them from creating. This is all they want to do all day long. The dilemma for the artist is, how do I make some money? And that's usually where the conflict comes in. And traditionally, I think there have been far fewer successful, commercially successful artists than there were artists in the world. I'm hoping that this is going to change because I think more so now we crave and desire beauty and art in all its form. That we, in this age of abundance, and we have more than we have ever had, we are living longer, that we want to have transcendent experiences, and the artists in the world are the ones who create this. And when I say artists, I, I also include in that group artisans, like people who shape buildings, lay down bricks, carve things out of stone and marble, because that's where the art lives. It's not just an idea, right? Yeah, and I think there's art in everything, like not only framed things on the wall, but in your hat, in your glasses, like everything is created with a purpose and for a reason. And if you look at the little things, you can see the beauty in it. But I think, I mean, to go back to this and why I'm struggling is because we're at a liberal arts school. It's not necessarily, did you, where did you go to? Art center, the okay. opposite of that. Yeah, so yes. I'm in this position where not everyone is just here to create beautiful, maybe not so beautiful, whatever, but it's more money driven. So I think, I mean, I'm a graphic design major, you know, I chose that for a reason because it sounds like I'm going to make some money, <laughs> but I'm, I'm still struggling because as an artist, like I don't need to make money, but 
I think we all need It'd to make nice. money. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all need to make money, right? Yeah. So there's some level of like existing and we need that. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for us to continue down our path, right? So we all need to make some level of money. I think there's a little bit more perceived security and being a designer than there is probably being an artist. Just for that same reason, like if you grew up thinking I'm going to be a professional fill in the blank basketball player or football person um, or play in the NFL or in the NBA, there's a very small percentage of the population that's going to be able to do that. So the artists that are commercially successful, that are living the life, um, maybe that's, we have far fewer examples of that. And so there's some assigned security in being a designer versus an artist. But those times are changing and they're changing really, really fast. So that's good news for all of you. Yes. You don't have to be dead to be a famous artist anymore. You don't have to be dead, but I'm talking about even more recently, like what's happening is the <laughs> barriers to entry, the ability to connect with an audience, the removal of curators, to decide, uh, I, I call them king or queen makers, right? Because they get to decide, Carly, you're the artist to look after. And then the whole machine, the apparatus of the art will come together and they put you into a gallery that's super hard to get into. They invite super fancy rich people to come in there. They buy your art and then they just make you. And so they held the keys to that uh, opportunity for you. But today, uh, with the proliferation of social platforms, whatever platform you're on, you now can have a direct relationship with your audience. And what's even cooler is that when you create something, you can find out really fast if they share the same emotion that you share. And that may or may not inform what it is that you do in the next iteration of your art. And you may make something that you think is terrible, and they're like, wow, that really touched me, and you inspired me. And then you have to sit back and reflect on that, like, what are they seeing that I'm not quite seeing? And I think that's the wonderful time that we live in. And that's why I say, like, it used to be this way. It may not be this way much longer. And these two separate spheres may be overlapping more and more so every single day. And I think that's really cool. One of the beautiful things that I get to do as a person who makes content, I get to meet old people, young people, people from all over the world, some self-taught, some highly trained, and they are building an audience and a community around the things that they do, that they exist mostly because of their connection to their audience, and it's a beautiful thing to see. And I'm really, really excited about that. So somebody can sit there and paint painstakingly something that they like, and an audience shows up for that, and then they can say, look, buy four of these, and I have my rent for this month, and that's what happens. So I think that's really cool, okay? So getting back to this thing, what word should we use to dis describe ourselves? Um, Seth Godin talked about this in, in our interview with him, and he's said this many more times, and he's like, when it's work, we ask ourselves, like, when are we done? But when it's art, it's like, can I get more? And that's why I wish for all of you at some point in your life that you get to look at yourself like this, that whether it looks artistic, whether it's beautiful or not, is irrelevant, but you have that freedom to be able to make something that people care about, that you touch, that hopefully then you are able to also receive some kind of compensation for that, that beauty, that thing that you bring into the world. Okay? Thank you. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, cool. Well, woof. let's just start off real easy like that. Okay, who's up next? And if you guys have follow-ups or you want to challenge something, I invite you to come into the pool. It's safe. And, or you want to add something to it. I'd love to hear your voices. You are, after all, the educated one. You really are. I don't say that to pander or to self-deprecate. Mostly I studied type, fonts, and got super nerdy with that kind of stuff. Yeah. Somebody else want to take it? And, and um, Jonah, you're monitoring the comments and all that stuff? Yeah. Jonah, I forgot to say this before we went live. It's like, you don't have to stress out over like cutting on all the cameras. You can just leave it on whatever and read comments and go to the bathroom. Do whatever you need to do. Don't worry. Okay, no stress. It's a low key live stream. Okay, uh, who's next? Can you tell me your name and then, and then hit me with your question? Yeah, my name's Christian. Christian. Traditional spelling, Christian? Yes. Great. Um, my question was, uh, being like someone who ex is like accepting the digital world and kind of uh, 
like taking it with a stride. What would you say like your opinion on the effect of technology like in the little bit far future uh, is like oversaturation or uh, <clears throat> like AI in the creative world? Okay. Um, let's see if I understand this. Are you asking me for my take on how technology and ultimately things like AI are going to impact the world, the world of art and design, or just the world? I think specifically the world of art and design. Mm. And are you seeing and reading about things that are giving you some concern? I mean, I've seen some interesting articles uh, really based around um, like creation of assets and like art and visuals just from algorithms or uh, deep learning or neural networks and it's very like it's amazing that we've gotten to that point but it's also scary because the quality of the work is reaching somewhere that um, like it's it's reaching a human potential okay and how do you feel about that are you excited by it or are you scared about that I think that it's it opens a world for like accessibility and creation. However, it's also, it also takes away some of the expressiveness of like being an artist. So that, I think that really scares me. Okay, so let's take it one at a time. So that was a complex answer and a question all rolled into one. So let's, let's try to figure out a couple of things. One is the progress of AI is happening, whether you like it or not. And one of the, 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 what's the, the serenity, serenity prayer is like to know what you can change, know the difference, and then the courage to do whatever. I totally butchered that. Somebody helped me out on that. But so if I can't change something, I try not to focus too much of my energy in that. And then I realize there's very little I can change, right? If you think about it, and I, I get asked this question quite often, is how long does it take for you to learn a new thing or to think a new idea? I said, for as long as you want to hold on to the old idea and how quickly you're ready to embrace the new idea. So for me, sometimes change is 24 hours. I wake up, I think about, I don't want to do that anymore. And that's the moment. And for some people, it takes 24 years. So I know I can't change this because I'm not in a space and a place where I can influence this. Maybe people like Elon Musk can and will and, and um, the, the CEO of, uh, or the founder of Alibaba, maybe they're, they're getting into AI, I don't know. So let's just take this to the extreme. Sometimes it helps us to think about things in the extreme. So if AI does exactly do what it is that we are afraid of doing, which is replacing humans, what is the human job then? What function do we have? And I think I like that idea a lot because if robots do all the work of humans, it gives us a lot of time to think, what is it that we want from our lives? So we don't spend a lot of time, I think, thinking about how much automation that already exists that we benefit from, right? So like when you, when you pick up your phone and you punch in a few things and you swipe on your phone, you don't even punch anymore, you just touch something. It connects it to some satellite, I think, or it reroutes you. There's like computers working all the time. And when you charge something uh, with your credit card at the gas station, it knows within like two seconds if it's you because it spots behaviors that are inconsistent with you and it flags you right away. Sometimes I travel abroad and I forget to tell the credit card company I'm traveling. They stop the payment and then they call me. And it's like, how do they know these things? It's incredible. And they're doing this a billion times a second, I think, because of all the transactions that are happening in the world. So there's a lot of benefit from that. But I think what's really cool is if you don't have to work anymore, if you don't have to do anything to live, like all your needs are taken care of, what would you focus on? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you in that um, automation, like of the practical things in life, like opens up creative opportunities and ways to fulfill your human, I guess, <laughs> what life is, you'll be able to focus on that more. Yeah. And I really love the idea of that. That's like truly beautiful. Yeah. But, but. and you're <laughs> going to say, but yeah, but, um, just, I guess in the, in the space between creation and automation is what I'm trying to get at. Um, like, will image making even be, I guess not, I'm not saying like useful, but will it be something that is unique 
to a human. And I think that that's an interesting thought. Like to think that AI may sometime, may someday have the possibility of creating something that like we can't even comprehend or that is unique to only that being. Well, I think there's a couple of things here is that if the AI technology gets so good and it probably will get really good in some point, maybe before I die, I don't know. And then it leaves you to question your existence, the meaning of life and purpose and love and beauty. That allows you to think a lot about this, I think. So what's really cool is we're already human in this room, right? We're all human, I think. Maybe not me, but we're all human. And that means that are you afraid of what it is that I'm going to do? Probably not. Because we have uniquely different points of view, different experiences, cultural backgrounds, all that kind of stuff, right? And are, if you were to give a brief to every single person in this room, the exact same brief with super rigid parameters, and give everybody the exact same tools, we would come up with 14 different pieces of design or art. So I'm already competing with you today for your job. You don't feel threatened by me. So these deep learning neural networks that are artificially intelligent driving things, it, let's say that they do achieve that human status. Are we afraid of the, another human? I don't think so because you get this beautiful opportunity to share your very unique voice with the world. And now free of the mundane, the monotonous, free of just trying to make a dollar to stay alive. I think I'm looking forward to that time. Now here's the really cool part, okay? I used Photoshop when it was version 1.0, I think. I'm there, okay? Pretty close to it. And we're in Creative Cloud territory right now, and there's things that Creative Cloud can do that we never dreamt possible. Uh, so I'm going to just date myself here. There was one undo, and there was one layer. I know, it's archaic. It's crazy. And that was it. There was, it wasn't called a layer because it was just it. And that was it. <laughs> so if you didn't like it, you're screwed. One undo. And on top of that, and, and I was there with AI, uh, not, a, not artificial intelligence, but Adobe Illustrator, probably 1.0 or 2.0, somewhere really, you know, we had to like work in the wire mode, that, the preview mode uh, or the outline mode, and then you'd hit command Y and it would draw it. So when the computers got fast enough and the tools got fast enough, when we could see it while we're working on it, that was a revelation, okay? I know you guys are like, oh my God. And I was also like rubbing two rocks together to make fire, but okay. So now we jump forward to CC and there's this thing where you select a magic wand masking tool and you just hit cut this out. It starts to think and it cuts it out and it's not great, but it's pretty good. Could you imagine that? And is that the task of a human to do, to cut out things, right? Or I give it an image and say match these colors and it just matches them. So I now become the artistic director of this versus the person who's literally trying to figure out, do I do it through HUSAP? Do I do it through levels or curves or channel mixer? I don't know. I just wanted to do that thing. Let's keep going with that. The next thing I do is I don't even touch the keyboard. I just say, cut it out. Match this color that I saw in this movie in this, this moment. And it brings up 35 images. This is where Adobe Sensei is going, by the way. This excites me. You guys see those tech demos that they do? So exciting. Where is this going? Now, they, they do these demos on, stage, on the stage, and it's, it's scary, crazy, like how good it's going to be. So you do something like this. They show this demo. It's crazy. And they draw like something like that, right? And so Adobe Sensei is that that's a rocket. Those are clouds. And it starts to build this from your library. It will melt your mind. Have you seen this demo? Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, my God. So it's looking through your image library. It's like, and he puts it together. It shapes it, and it figures out from a drawing almost as bad as mine. It knows. It's been learning. That excites me. That does not scare me. Because who, who used to do this job? Okay, you're the art director. Uh, some young intern it was like, a, a bus, is, is, that's a rocket, and you want clouds. What time of day is it? And then they go through, and it's like days before you see something, and you're like, mm, that's not what I want. 
right? It would, it would try to guess at what you want. And then there's a slider somewhere. They pull it up because it's still in beta. You slide, it's like night, day, this, and more clouds, less clouds, and it's crazy. It's just cycling, and it's cutting it out for you automatically. That means your ability to think and create, the gap between those two are getting closer and closer and closer. That's very exciting. So who came up with this sketch then? Now, is the computer with all this AI learning, is going to look at a brief and figure it out? Maybe, but it's going to be a long time from now. So here's what I say to you. This we cannot control. And how we look at AI right now, they're tools. And I'm excited about more powerful tools that allow me to concentrate on thinking more than finding images and cutting them out. Right? I don't know about you, but I have thousands of images on my drive, legally, of course, thousands of images. And I have to go through, and I have two boys. Uh, one of them's 13, the other one's 16. I paid my 13-year-old to go through my files and name them for me. He'd rather play video games. This is not the job of a human. Adobe Sensei is renaming all your files for you. It's meta-tagging every single thing. So you just say face, left, woman, 40, and it will just pull it up. And it'll show you the best ones. And it's crazy where this is going to be in a few short years. So literally, like, my son's like, Dad, I don't know what that is. I'm like, go on the internet and figure it out. If I have to tell you, you're wasting my time. So he's going through and naming these things. And then after working for me all of one day, he quit. <laughs> Even a 13-year-old is tired of doing rote work like that. We don't want to do that, OK? You guys understand that, right? So I look at the tools, and I say, well, there's two feelings we can have about it, right? There's probably more, but I like to think in a binary way, being that I'm a robot. So we could be happy about it, or we can be miserable about it. And every time I start to feel miserable about it, I start to rethink what words I want to assign to these tools. I say it's empowering. It's saving time. It allows me to think. I move it to a happy place. And that's what I try to do with almost everything in my life. I try to change the words so that my reality is different. Yeah, I, I really respect that uh, mindset is very, very powerful in like how you perceive reality and what you experience. Um, I think the core of what I was trying to get at yeah. now that I'm like having now you're this shaping dialogue, it. Okay, perfect. Uh, is the expressive, like the the human touch. Like I, I love that. Like I've I've actually seen something very, very similar. So I think it might have been connected in some way. Yeah. Um, I feel that. The tools and their accuracy and perfection will take away, like, like Bob Ross said, happy little accidents. Yeah. I don't know. Do you think so? The fidelity of the finished product is still in your control. Because you could say, like, computer or mother, change it to be rough. Change the time of day. Make it like a kid drew it. Not with a crown, but with a pencil. So these are all just tools. You are the director of this. Uh, these are just instruments. You get to compose the song. You can make it like hard rock, or you can make it metal, or you can make it punk or classical. In, in no point in this equation does the computer tell you what to do. I mean, maybe they will one day. That's a different story, the T3000. And that's what we have to live with. But not, not right now. I mean, one day you'll show up and talk to a computer, and it'll tell you what to do, I suppose. And then the world is upside down. That's when Skynet is taken over, right? But until then, it's like we, we still get to control how, how clean, how dirty, how, how crude, how refined. Uh, make the rocket metal. No, I mean rusty metal. And I want to see the rivets. And um, I want you to age it 10 years. I mean, wouldn't, you, wouldn't that be a wonderful tool? I agree. Like, the, the freedom that it allows yeah. us is, like, unimaginable right now. Or, well... We're imagining like it, so it's imaginable, soon, yeah. But I, I think it's just like the the room for mistake, for mistakes from your own being are like kind of deleted, so to speak. The mistakes, the happy accidents. Yeah, I, I feel like yeah, oh. we, as humans, we okay. are flawed. I but like this. The mistakes that we would make in creating that image, specifically how we want it, um, could just fall away. Okay, let me ask you something, because I actually do a lot of work, and over time, it's given me more exposure. I'm not saying I'm any smarter than you, I just have more exposure than you, right? Look at this word, happy accident. You see that that's a change in words. Accident, most of us don't like. 
when you get into an accident, they're not favorable. So, so Bob would talk about it as a happy accident, meaning I discovered something I didn't intend to do. It was a discovery. So he changed the word accident to mean discovery, that there was something called chance, right? And there enters a randomness to it that I think we like, okay? And that there's some kind of exploration that you don't always end up at the same spot. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like this, where you go and look for an image on the internet because you're trying to finish up an assignment the night before. Let's just say you were there. And you're like looking through an image, and then you see another image that you didn't intend to look for. And then you go down that rabbit hole. And if you're on Pinterest, this happens every second. And you're like this, and you're like lost in the exploration of chance. I don't, and we, we, I find great pleasure in this. And I look for a word, and I find an artist, and I find a, a, a video, and then a, a review of something else. And it, the danger is actually we get lost in the chance and the randomness of it all, right? And so we're like, focus, what does the brief say? What do we need to do? How much time do I have left? And you, you get it done. So in this example of the AI taking over, maybe they misinterpreted your drawing. Maybe this was meant to be a crown with some scribbles around it but they instead showed you a rocket, which then spawned a new idea for you. And I know this, working in solitude is actually a really hard way to work, because we need feedback. We need to know, is this idea communicating to you? Because art is a transmission of a signal, so the receiver has to, to get that same signal. But what if the computer or our partners, a collaborator, that you tell it an idea, it tells you something back, and then it's this dialogue that you have with it. That would be very exciting, don't you think? Yeah, I, I so really think that that's a beautiful idea, like the inf infinite, infinitesimal like possibilities. That's, yeah, I think you've changed the way I you're seeing so. things. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. If I didn't like it, I would just change it in my mind to then like it, because there's not much I can do about it. <laughs> really, I'm just being totally serious with you, okay? And I've shared uh, on, on different live streams, like very personal stories where I'm like, oh, that sucks. That really, really does suck. And I have to work really hard to re choose new words. And I'll give you an example. I like to do this because it's not me. I'll just embarrass my wife. I have been driving. I've never had a moving violation in my life. I've had a few, like one or two parking tickets. So I'm a pretty good driver, despite the stereotype. I'm a good Asian driver, okay? And then my wife, who's also Asian, she gets a ticket. And it's an expensive one. And then I look at it, I'm like, uh, honey, you know, you're just throwing money. It's like, let's say it's $350. I'm like, uh, can you? And she goes, no. She just stops me there, because I'm about to nag her a little bit. I'm about to say, let's be prudent. Let's just be more careful. She goes, no. Well, I love the city that we live in. I'm like, what's the guy to do with your ticket? It's a donation. <laughs> so she stopped the conversation. I don't know who she learned this stuff from. This is BS, you know. I'm like, what the? F <laughs> okay, let's watch Breaking Bad then. I don't know what to do. So she just moved it from a penalty to somebody has to contribute to the city to maintain the city. It's a donation. That's it. And we have to support this. And I find, okay, that's fair. That works for me. You see how it's like I could be upset, she could be upset. You just move the words. New reality. Same exact situation. That's how powerful this stuff is. Yeah, thank you. So, so we haven't talked about design at all, but this is cool. I like these kind of conversations. You're welcome, Christian. Hi. Hello, um, what's your name? My name's Alyssa. Alyssa? Yes. With an E? Uh, it's A-L-Y-S-S-A. -S -S thank you for spelling that for me. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so I think something that a lot of us are talking about a lot and thinking about a lot and um, trying to make decisions about is um, pertaining to this idea of how to determine your value or worth as a designer or artist. And like, I personally think there's some overlap in the definitions of being an artist and a designer. And yes. I think, um, yeah, I just think it's definitely a difficult thing to try to determine your worth, especially um, as you're starting out in the industry. And so I just wanted to know your thoughts and opinions on that. When you're starting out, can you reframe the question? I yeah, followed you, but I, I couldn't find the question in there. 
Yeah, so I think a lot of us are struggling with that because, um, well, I think as we live, like you said, in, in such an age where um, we're living with more stuff everywhere than we ever have before, and there's so many, um, I don't know, visual graphics and photographs, and there's just art everywhere, and so I think people tend to expect that art is free or just art is just guaranteed. Um, and same thing with design, it's just everywhere on every screen we look at and every billboard, um, especially in a place like LA. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the only people that are gonna advocate for us starting out as designers and artists are ourselves. And I think that's kind of a difficult thing um, to be able to determine what your worth is when you're looking for jobs or freelancing. So what is your advice on that? Okay, there's a lot there. Let's say, so Sorry. first I, I wanna throw this out, okay? And, and, and guide the ship back on the rails if I jump off the rails here, okay? So first you say art and design's everywhere. And okay, I accept that. This is why like, people don't like me at LMU because I'm like, well, I don't know if I agree with that, but okay, art and design's everywhere. We could say that. Yeah, we can agree, yeah, everybody? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But good art and design is almost nowhere. Can we say that? All you have to do is go to the store. Sure, yeah. Well, right? Yeah. Like, look There's at this. There's a lot of bad design and bad art, yeah. Yeah, if we were to say the tipping scale, <laughs> you know, the scale of justice or whatever of art and design, mm -hmm. of good and bad design, and good and bad art, in my mind, and this is probably one time I'm gonna get kind of dark and negative on you, I think it's like that. Oh. <laughs> like, that's the floor of bad, right? And there's like, good. And I look at this as a good news, because if you're a maker of good things, there's a lot of opportunity for you to like put another pebble on that side. Don't you think? Like all you have to do is go to the store. Now, it's odd, I find this quite odd, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised, but when you go to a supermarket, when you go to a Vons or a Ralph's, I don't know what the other kind of normal supermarkets are, and then you go to a Whole Foods, mm -hmm. or you go to an Air One, it's like, everything looks more beautiful. It's like the packages look better and everything looks refreshing and, and amazing. And why is that? What happened there? So like, do, do rich people deserve better design? <laughs> Does good design cost more money? These are questions that I look at. Like I stare at the um, seltzer water aisle or I'm just looking at like this. I never even seen these brands before, but every single one of them is beautiful. You go back to Ralph's and Vons and almost everything is ugly, <laughs> right? Right. Everything. And I'm not talking about just the packaging. I'm talking about what's inside of it is ugly. Mm -hmm. Processed foods made in the cheapest possible way mm -hmm. versus some, and, and, and made with all kinds of preservatives. Like, I, I guess I will pay more. So I, I think the world is full of bad design. And I would say, the, and I'm being mean here, it's like probably 99% bad. This is why we celebrate good design, because it's so exceptional, right? This is why we remark on good design. Go to the bookstore, if it still exists. Go to the bookstore, look at the jackets. Which ones appeal to you? Which ones draw you in? Which ones are crappy? And I think there's a correlation, not causation yet, of the bargain bins. Almost all those books are ugly, <laughs> cheaply made, poorly written. And when I say ugly, all the way through. Very rarely do I walk into the bargain bin and I find an amazing book. But it does happen. It was so good that nobody bought it. And I mean that in all seriousness. And that the general population couldn't understand that this was beautiful. And I picked up this Chris Ware box set. I'm like, why is this 40% off? I'm taking this, this is a steal. Okay, so I think there's a lot of bad design in the world. This is an opportunity for you guys if you're good and if you know how to make good things, good art and good design. Now, you're talking about self-worth and value, like when you're first starting out, how, how do you communicate that to somebody? Well, this is the challenge. I guess we're gonna get businessy on everybody now, right? The challenge is how do you communicate your worth and value? That's a good question. Is that the question that you wanna know? Yeah, I guess just how the two are related was I was just saying I think like people just have an expectation that they deserve good design or just that they, um, 
Really? I don't know. There's, it, it seems to be, yeah, I think in working, especially freelance, I think working with clients and stuff, like, it seems like a lot of people kind of just have expectations that design is free. I think maybe more so related to what Christian was saying, like, because there are so many, like, websites and online programs and things that, like, you can design your own stuff for free, or there's just, like, a bunch of free graphics. Okay. Um, that people kind of expect that stuff is free or that, like, they'll market it. it as, like, oh, let's collaborate or you do this and, like, let's, you know, do it together. And it's, like, it's just an expectation that you're going to do what you do for work for free. Cause yeah. Okay. We're going to get into some, some business principles here in a second. Excuse me. How many clients have you worked with as a freelancer? Total. Roughly. Nobody can tell, by the Roughly, I don't know, 10 to 20? Perfect. I'll take the high number of 20. Okay? So you've had 20 different clients? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You're doing well, by the way, person still in school. You're doing fantastic. You're making a lot of people self-conscious right now. Like, I've done one, and it was my mom, and it didn't even count because she, she made me pay her. You know? That was rough. So you worked with 20 clients. Damn. I don't know if I worked with 20 clients first year out of school. So you're doing well. Everybody needs to take a marketing lesson from Alyssa in her networking <laughs> class later today. Okay. So 20 clients. Of the 20, what percentage expected good design for free? Well, if we're going with the high number of 20, I think. We are, just not. Okay, like, that's okay. the reality. Okay. <laughs> Once it's on the board, it's real. Um, hmm. Well, there's some clients that I like recently had to stop working with for that reason of like sure um what percentage help me out oh man just get me to the finish line uh, here like <laughs> come on maybe maybe like 30 40 percent what i don't know yeah okay maybe she's not that good at marketing because <laughs> half her clients i'm gonna take the high number right you guys never mind everybody's canceling out of that class right now <laughs> they were just auditing they just dropped okay so 40 percent of the clients no, I have to use the egg rolls <laughs> on you, right? <laughs> Want it done for free or to, for next to no money. Right. Well, okay. Um, can we say that a free client is not a client? That the definition of a client is a, a trade of money for services? Yes? Because otherwise it's charity. I call that charity. Right, yeah. And are these charitable organizations? <laughs> are they? No. No. So that's usually, that's usually when I give them the one finger salute. You know what I mean? I'm not going to do it, right? <laughs> Just like take a long walk off a short bridge or go swimming and hold a big rock. That's what I usually feel about those people, right? Like I don't need you in my life because we have to distinguish charity, right, from clients. Big difference. Right. They have a cause and they truly are broke. They really are broke, most of them. Uh, they have no cause. Their cause is capital, okay? And they're not broke, they're just broken. <gasps> no, really, yeah. they are. Because they're willing to take advantage of people who are in the greatest need of opportunity. They never take advantage of the big firms. I shouldn't say never, they rarely take advantage of the big firms. So I think that's terrible. Okay, so we need to distinguish the two. So somebody who has money, who can pay, who's in commerce, should pay a fair market price for the creative services that you do. This is wonderful now. So now we've established you have not 20 clients, <laughs> right? Right. How many clients do you have? You have 12. 40% were bad, we dumped. So now we have 12. My math okay? You math majors, come on. It was a long time. Okay, we're not math majors either. Okay, so we have 12 out of 20 that are legitimate clients, okay? Because 40% were bad. Now, of those 12, now we'll focus on this. So you've had, um, I would say, a total of eight bad clients. And we're going to label them bad clients because that's what they are. Okay, you have eight bad clients and you're struggling with this. And one of their excuses to you is, well, isn't it really easy? And don't you have all these tools? And you know I could just call Fiverr and do this? That's usually what they say. That's the crap that comes out of their mouth, right? How many have had that experience? Okay, a couple of you. Oh, this sucks. Kind of. Well, I think a, a more common experience <clears throat> for, for people working, I think, with peers specifically is, like, um, people our age don't have, like, 
a super large budget to spend on design slash they have those expectations people as well. People your age? Yeah. Really? How old are these people? Like early 20s. Like 24? Well, yeah, I mean like 20 to 24 maybe. Okay. Yeah, sure. So we're going to make another broad statement. People that are 20 or 24 are just broke. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are? Kind of? <laughs> You're like looking at each other like, yeah, we know what that yeah. feels like. Yes. And they're starting businesses? Um, some of, well, different types of clients, I guess. Like, um, Are you talking about classmates that are clients? Um, not classmates category. necessarily, but like um, musicians or like oh, those broke people. people starting like clothing lines or like the, you okay. know, that kind All of right. thing. All right. Sure. Okay. So let, let's just talk about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. You may say that musicians are in the charity case. Mm -hmm. You may. That's for you to decide. I wouldn't. I'll tell a story later maybe that we'll have to see how fair about this. Okay. Uh, with the, one of the world's biggest bands who said that we have no money. I'm like, Really? I saw your Christmas special. Are you sure you have no money? <laughs> Looks like you spent a lot of money. In fact, I think your catering budget is bigger than what we're talking about. So, you know, so you may consider artists, musicians, uh, that are your charity case. Do you consider them your charity case or not? Put them in one of two categories, charity or clients. Man, I want them to be able to be clients. Because <laughs> you want the chatter? Yeah. Really? Sure. So it's like, forget about them then. <laughs> no more charity. Maybe your new rule has to be, I'm going to do 10 clients before I give one away. Okay. Maybe, because you got loans, don't you? You got bills to pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're saying that you don't have loans. Oh, yeah. You have a scholarship? What was that? No, yeah. I'm it's too personal. Okay. <laughs> so stay, on, stay on target here. Okay, here we go. So there's got to be some ratio that you're happy with. Some people do. I, I have a friend. He, he does... 50% charity, 50% client. But he's very careful. There's a whole auditing process about um, who's going to be considered for charity. Right. Yes. Very nice. That's his, no, that's his company. That's his company. Yeah, you know, I was complimenting him like, well played, Dave. Beautiful. Very nice. No. He is very nice. He is. He gives 50% of his business away for free. Yeah. Wow, that's a good business model. It's also part of his marketing and his platform. It's really cool. Now, mm -hmm. if a musician can't pay you, you have some choices. Now, I want you guys to just remember this, okay? Is you're not a prisoner of this, you have choice. And choice is a powerful thing. You have freedom and free will to make these choices. So we don't do something and then later complain like, why did they force me to do this, right? My business coach would say to me for a number of years, he would say, Chris, there are no victims, just volunteers. Because I'm like, I would complain to him. And every time I would complain to him, he'd look right back at me. Are you a victim or a volunteer? I'd be like, my employees are driving me crazy, Kier. Um, who's the wise person who hired them? Me. <laughs> who allowed the boundaries to slip for them to be able to do this? Me. Who allows this behavior to persist? Me. Who hasn't fired them yet? Me. Are you a victim or are you a volunteer? See, the words are kind of crazy. Okay. I was playing the victim, but I was in control. If you accept a job, you've accepted the terms of the job. If you don't like it, just say no. There's only a couple of instances where you have to take the job. Design client points a gun at your head. Do this logo for me now. Then you can say, I'm a victim, and that's okay. All right? Until then, no. So if they don't have money, uh, we have to go back to ancient times. People didn't trade with money before. They traded with other, um, with other things that they had, services. Um, they have things of value that are not based on currency. What could a band give you that you think would be valuable? Well, I think that ties in a lot is like, I think a place that all of us are in is like portfolio building and publicity. And so I think that's a big thing with like jobs that you're <laughs> not paid for. I think a lot of people <laughs> believe in this idea of like paying with exposure, which is like very frustrating. I have some exposure <laughs> bucks at home I'll give you later. Okay, <laughs> Literally, I do. Somebody made them, sent them to me. Oh my exposure bucks, yeah, literally. Okay, <laughs> let's say that you're gonna do something for a band, right? What market value would you place on whatever it is you do? We don't need the specifics, just give me a number. What, what, sorry, what's the what question? would you charge the musician to do this thing if you could just charge them the fair market value for what it is that you're doing? Oh, boy. 
Just say a number. It doesn't matter. Okay. Hundred. Thousand? A <laughs> hundred bucks? <laughs> I don't know. You're not going to pay off that Loyola loan on a hundred dollar job. Are you kidding me? Are you watching our channel? Oh my God. Are you watching our channel? No. Okay. That's why. You've done a hundred dollars. Try again. You get three guesses. See, this is why I'm asking this question is because I yes. have no idea what my this worth is. This is like family feud. Your first guess is burnt. You have three more, you have two more guesses now. What should you charge? Come on. They'll never come back again, oh, Dave. Man. Yes. It's like fresh batch of seniors. And after that, it's like a year later. God, I don't know. Um, <laughs> a thousand. <laughs> I don't know. Let's say $4,000. Okay, perfect. Okay, so that. that was strike two. You only get one more strike. Okay, let's say what you want to charge them for what you're doing. Now I'm starting to question your whole 12 clients now, okay? 4,000. 4,000, okay? Okay. $4,000. You say, musician, you want something done, it's going to cost you 4000 They say to you, boo-hoo, we're broke, you know, saps story. We don't have any money. We're just musicians. That's all we know how to do, right? <laughs> yeah, I go, okay, fine. What are you going to give me? What are you going to give me that's worth $4,000? Right. It can't be exposure because they can't even give you exposure. Yeah. You can get yourself exposure. You can get yourself the portfolio piece, but that's on you. That doesn't count against this $4,000 debt they have. What could they give you? Let's get really creative. You guys are creative people. Let's try and figure it out. What can they give you? Yes, concert tickets, right? Yes. Do you like their music? Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. This is so fake. Okay. <laughs> That's really fake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you don't like this band you're working with. This is truly not charity then. Concert tickets. Okay. So what are concert tickets cost? What do they cost? I don't know. I haven't been to a concert, concert. in a while. I, I mean, 50 bucks? I'm gonna, well, if it's a good concert, small band, probably small more band. like, I mean, come okay, on. okay, yeah. Yeah, basic bucks. cover charge, yeah. So yeah, it's $15. Sure. <laughs> that's going to be a lot of concerts you're going to be going to. <laughs> what else can they give you that's valuable? Uh, Don't bands have merch? Yeah. They have merch, mm -hmm. okay? So there's the value on the merch. Put a dollar sign on that somewhere. Yes? A guitar, because they do that, right? They can't give you the tools in which they need, because they'll be like air guitaring the rest of the time, right? Right. Okay, so they can't give you the guitar. What else can they give you? How? Yeah. Is there a second mic? No, just one. Okay. They could give you connections, like referring you to other bands or other people in yes. their business. Yes, okay. Yes, they can refer you. That's the minimum they can do. So they'll tell all their band friends that have no money, that pay nothing. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> you're going to be in debt forever. This is the problem. It's true. Referrals are valuable from valuable people. This is the problem. It's like, I got four homeless friends. You guys want to help them? Cool. All right, so a referral. Okay, yes. That might be valuable. If you can trade those in for money, is there anything else they can do? I think so. There's more. Come on, guys, get unstuck on this. Don't get <laughs> fixated with the number. It's just a trade. What can I do for you? What can you do for me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can invite this man that you don't like to play at your birthday. <laughs> right? That's going to be wonderful. Give guitar lessons. Yes. <laughs> lessons. Okay, what are lessons worth? You're very creative. 150 bucks? Woo, they're doing all right now. They're moving up in the world. 150 an hour. This is awesome. Okay, uh, they can probably literally um, uh, make posts on their social media on your behalf. So when we say give me exposure, this is an, an act that they have to participate in, right? So if they have a decent following, they can say, you know, I'm going to really thank Alyssa for doing this work for us, and she's amazing, and here's her Instagram handle, and you guys should definitely hire her. Boom. Right. That's worth something. If small audience, it's worth less. Big audience, it's, little worth, it's worth a little more. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask them for metrics and just measure all this stuff. So you can get really creative, okay? Now, we've established a few things. We've established that... Um, that they... The, you don't like their music. You may or may not like their merch. So definitely you don't want to take lessons from them. But you can trade this to somebody else. Mm -hmm. You can give these away to 
your favorite nephew or niece. Instead of sending them 150 bucks for their birthday, like, guess what? Guess what auntie did for you? You're going to love this band. <laughs> They're amazing. Check out this shirt I got you. You can trade it all. We live in, we can, we, we're just bartering. That's all. You got to get your value though. So all this stuff has to add up to this, if not more than this, because it's hard to change this. This requires work. So I would not do an even trade here. Maybe, maybe you think they got potential. And you can say, I want a guarantee on something. I want a percentage of this or that. And I'll do all your design and branding for you. Is that cool? And some bands will do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. You got to just sort of get really creative on how to get paid. And you have to learn how to charge more and value your work more than the 100 bucks you're charging. <laughs> Okay? Yeah, definitely. Okay. On a different day and a different hour, we'll talk about why you came up with the number 100. <laughs> we'll have to figure this out. Okay. Okay? So what you want to do, I hope, I'm going to give you some advice here, even though you didn't ask me, is this is my model in life. It really is. I want to do the least amount of work for the fewest number of people to get paid the most amount of money. I don't want the opposite. I don't want to do the most amount of work for the most <laughs> amount of people to get paid the least amount of money. We have to invert that equation for you. So a lot of people hear this and say, well, oh, you can't tell the kids that. That's bad advice. It's like, no, you're going to create a bunch of monsters that are egotistical and arrogant and running around and think they're worth so much money. Maybe. But I'd rather create those kind of monsters than the ones who sell themselves short and wind up broke. Living uh, check to check not having anything for themselves, and getting into either some kind of real accident and then not being able to take care of themselves. That would be a bigger sin for me. The other thing that I think of is when I say that, then you have to start to ask yourself this question, what can I do that would be valuable to whom for doing what? And then acquire those skills. That's the critical part of this equation. I want to do something that's worth a lot of money and I know that there's a gap between where I am and where I want to be. And then I work really hard to get to, to that other spot. I'll tell you a little side story here. I heard from a friend of mine that he hired a coach. And the coach has got a very specific way of working. This coach flies into town, which you pay for, and the hotel, and he charges $10,000 to meet with you for one day. At the end of the day, he gets back on the plane, he goes home, he writes up a summary, he sends it to you, and that's it. 10,000 bucks. And I thought to myself, wow, that's amazing. I want that. But I didn't just sit there and start saying, like, I want 10,000 bucks for a day's worth of work. I started thinking, started thinking about, like, what can I do that somebody would then also feel equally satisfied with me doing that work for 10,000 bucks? Blair Enns calls this, like, the double thank you, where I genuinely thank you for paying me, and you genuinely thank me for doing this wonderful work for you. I thank you, you thank me. That's a relationship I'm talking about. I'm not talking about cheating people, okay? So then I worked for a couple of years to develop the skills, the positioning of my own brand and what it is that I do, that I started to get paid $10,000 for a day. Then I got paid more and more and more, and I just kept learning what those skills were necessary so that the clients would feel that. And they do genuinely thank you afterwards. So I want to plant that seed in your brain right now. Do something that's valuable for someone. You won't be there today but start working to acquire those skills. They are things that you can learn. Okay? Okay. All right, are we okay, Alyssa? You have yeah. fun with this band? Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> All right. Jonah, yeah. do we have any questions from the audience? No. Okay, thanks. You said that so like nobody's watching, I got it. Okay. Yeah, 285. 285, 285, hello. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Annika. Annika? Mm -hmm. I'm going to need help. <laughs> A-N-N-I-K-A. -N -N -A. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, Annika. Okay. Not as hard as I thought. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's more intuitive. Okay. What's your question? So we've been talking about how there's design everywhere and there's technology advancing. So with this technology advancing, we have access to a larger library of information than ever before. How do we go about creating content that hasn't been seen before and isn't 
sampling from other work when we're exposed to it on a daily basis because sometimes we can even do it subconsciously like we create something and we're like oh this looks like this how do we avoid making something repetitive and create new and interesting content okay uh, that's a very valid question you want to create new never before seen wow okay that's super ambitious okay it's a noble thing to try to strive for this and i think especially uh, people in school tend to want to do this and then you get old and jaded like me and you're like no nah. Maybe not possible, I don't know. So I'm gonna ask you this question in all seriousness and, and all due respect. When's the last time you saw something new and never before seen? Or never seen before? You're gonna search your mind a really long time. I know. Okay? Now, I have had this debate uh, since I was like 20 years old with my classmates, okay? Let's talk about new, okay? The word new is awesome, new, okay? What is new, okay? So if you, you know, this is you, uh, and you look at something and you say, wow, that's new, because why? Why is it new? Okay? You see that and you're like, that's new. Why is it new? Because you've not seen it. It's new to you. But then somebody like me comes along and says, new? No, I've seen this already. So... Is it still new? Mm. Maybe it's semi-new? <laughs> really? So this is now called semi-new. You guys in your language skills, okay. Tell me why you say semi-new. Well, I mean, especially because we are people who study design, we're probably going to have more exposure, like you said, you have more exposure than we do, okay. um, to certain elements of design. Yeah. So it depends on who your audience is. Oh, okay, it's just new to the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair. Is that what you're looking for? When you say never before seen, there's a big asterisk there. The asterisk is to you. Is that okay? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So if I share new ideas with you today that you've not seen before, you're like, that guy comes up with new ideas. When I'm like, no, everything I know is from a book or a thing I read or watched or somebody else coached me on. And most of my new ideas are terrible. All I'm doing is presenting to you information that you believe to be new. And so this is a much more realistic goal to hit. I like this, so new to you. So how do you create work that's new to the audience? You have to first understand who the audience is. Okay, this is, uh, is going to lead us somewhere here. I think this is going to be good, I think. Okay, so the target, the bullseye, is much clearer now versus creating just new, like never before seen. Because I think there's very few things that are never before seen because everything just gets remixed. It really does. And technology allows us to remix more creatively now, right? And so we're like, that's a new application of an old idea. That's new enough. Okay, so new to this audience. So you have to say, like, what is this audience looking at all the time? So this is a bunch of little people, okay? I hope you can see this. There's a bunch of people, okay? So this is, we'll call this the creative watering hole. So they all come here and they're like, well, this is so new, okay? Now it's all really old stuff. It really is. So all you have to do is go over here and say, hey, guys, there's this thing, and you bring it over there, and you're like, hey, what about this thing? And then they'll say it's new. So here's the thing. If you're in fashion, look at architecture. If you're in photography, look at cinema. If you're in cinema, look at musicals or plays. All you have to do is go outside. So I think there's a quote that I, I'm, I'm, I don't know who, who said this, but the secret to originality is to hide your sources. That's all it is. So I remember back in the day, the pre-internet age, designers, classmates of mine, literally had a secret stash. They'd have like weird, obscure magazines and catalogs. You know these people. And they would hoard their secret sauce. If they had a font that not everybody had, and they're just busting out this design, everybody else was using Helvetica or Futura, and, and you look at them like, dude, what, what is that? I don't know. I don't know. You know. It's a commercially made font. You just won't tell me. I see, so they're very protective of the sources, right? 
And so that's how they held on to their value, by hiding their sources. And so there's a degree to that, that if you don't show people your secret sauce, so to speak, you'll be more valuable. And a lot of creatives think that. Do you guys know of any creative person that hides all their secrets? Do you? No? I do. What's that? Yeah, but did you ever go to one of your friends? Like, How'd you do that? Oh, you know, you didn't figure it out. You know, how'd you create that texture? Yeah, you, you know, under the rug. That's what they do. You guys maybe live in a different era where everybody shares everything, but I know people my age, right? They're amazing. What's that? Hyper competitive. And yeah, and so they look at me like I'm this charlatan because I just share everything. Is there anything you want to know? If I know it, I'll share it with you. I don't hide anything. And then they're like, Chris, you're just like, what are you doing? You're creating a lot of animals out there. What are you doing? Why would you do that? And I, uh, I invite them to come on the show. And hey, I love how you did that. Will you tell us how to do that? No, no, I don't want a lot of competitors. I don't want a clone. And then sometimes I talk to them like, how's business? I don't have any work. Is there any surprise? You're like the best kept secret. In the meantime, <laughs> here I am. Really, it's what's happening. They won't share Jack. Because they think, like, we can't figure it out. But I'm not that stupid. I can figure out just about anything. So here we are. We share and we openly expose every single thing, even, like, how much money we make or whatever. We share it all. And yet we're turning down clients. So we live in this new society now where sharing is powerful. Hoarding is selfish. Sharing is more powerful than hoarding. Because when you share, people invite you to go and speak at things, and then you onboard fans, and then they have bosses, and those bosses need people, and then they get referred, and they get work. You enroll people into your art and your art-making process. So if you want to do something new, go where nobody's looking, bring it back to this world, they get excited, and then tell them exactly what you did. That's powerful stuff. Okay? Uh, there's also um, this idea of new, and I'm talk t tomorrow about this. So if you like this and you want to go deeper, I'm going to talk about this t in tomorrow's live stream. Is about new is just showing me old. It really is. Show me something old in a new way. That's all it is, man. And that's what technology allows us to do. Because there's very little new. And if you think about it, how many times have you seen a story about a guy who loves a girl, but they can't get together? Because like he's a jock and she's an artist, right? Yeah. Or he's poor and she's rich. We see the same story over and over and over again, yet you are so happy to give money to people to make these stories. It's because we figured out what ideas work and we figured out what ideas do not work. And so we like to repeat the ideas that work. And that's why the story of Romeo and Juliet is just told over and over again. It really is. They just change the variables. Oh, guy wants girl. Can't get the girl. She's not interested in guys. Okay. Guy wants girl. Can't get the girl. Why? Because his business is at war with her business. It just goes on and on. So we're not really looking for new. We're looking for familiar, but presented differently. Okay. So I'll give you one trick, just one trick. One trick is the big small. Have you guys heard of the big small? It's exactly what it sounds like, the big small, okay? All you have to do is make something big small. It's really that, it, that simple, okay? Have you seen these um, sculptures on a grain of rice? Something big, small. Have you seen people build miniature sets of like real places? And then they zoom out, and it's like the size of their hand. That's fascinating, because I've never looked at it like that. So what we're doing is we're reintroducing an old idea that's new. And we could do the opposite. We can make the small big. Have you seen that? Have you seen sculptures that look like this? And this is the size of a person? Mm -hmm. We made something small and big. And it forces us to look at something in a way that we've never seen before. Because here's the truth. You and I, we walk around the world to 
to differing degrees, oblivious to the world. We really are. And then one day, you stop to notice a crack in the sidewalk, and you look at it, and you stare at it, and it looks like the face of Jesus or something, and that's the revelation for you that one moment. Obviously, I know that's not what's happening, but you know, you see that, and you're like, guys, guys, Instagram. And then, you, and then people, it blows up. Um, and I gotta find uh, Jesus on the street of LA. That's what it is. So you're just showing them something that they've missed. And there's a good reason why we, we, we ignore all these things. And the reason why we ignore these things is because it's too taxing on our brain to process every single thing that's happening to us the whole time. You would just fall over in fatigue and burn all the calories. So this is all you need to do. So one of the assignments I would give my students is I would tell them to go and get a macro lens and shoot something and show me something that we never pay attention to. The back side of a keyboard, the cracks in between something, or the printing on the bottom side of a package. Show me something that I don't think about. And that's how you discover the new, in the old. That's all it is. Okay. You have a follow-up? You okay? Yeah, I'm okay. just listening. <laughs> all right, cool. All right, excellent. I have to tuck my shirt in here. It is popping out. I shouldn't have had that chicken. Okay. Um, somebody else? Okay, finally to the front row. <laughs> so, um, What's your name? Diego. Diego. Like San? So sorry? Like San? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so as we're like preparing to go into the workforce, I personally feel this pressure to specialize or like instead of saying I'm a visual artist, go to say you're a graphic designer or even specialize even more and say you're a typographer. Yeah. And I feel um, I feel like I have all these interests, all these passions that as society goes on, it's like we're trying to make these specialized humans instead of having this well-roundedness. And mm -hmm. even going to a liberal arts school, I still feel this pressure, so I can't even imagine if you're like really? in, a, in an art school, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, my question is like, do you believe like society should um, prefer like the specialization or a more well-roundedness. Okay. I will tell you, I've answered this question many times before and I'm prepared. Cool. <laughs> uh, because I don't know the exact location. Is that okay, guys? Okay. It's the specialist versus the generalist debate. And you may think you're specializing now at LMU, but you're not, not even close. I promise you that, I promise you, okay? Uh, versus the generalists. And even at, at a school like Art Center, they're still pretty generalists. They teach them a lot of different skills. Okay, so I'm gonna help you answer this question in a number of different ways. I'm not gonna tell you the answer, but I'm gonna make a, a, hopefully an argument or present some data for you to consider, okay? Okay, um, the generalist uh, knows many things, right? And the specialist tends to focus on the one thing. And they just go deep. And we go wide. Okay? When you want to hire somebody to solve a problem, do you want to hire somebody that has surface level experience on many things or the person who has great depth in one thing? What do you think? You have a problem. Diego has a problem. Diego, tell me what a problem might be. It could be any kind of problem. Um, Anytime, anything that you need help with. Any job you're trying to get done. A uh, math problem. <laughs> Not that kind of problem. Okay. You find the one problem like, what the f <laughs> Okay, fine, fine, I'll work with that, you rat. Okay, math, <laughs> math problem. Okay, trying to derail me right here. You've got a math problem, you suck at math. Yeah. Let's just assume. Um, you're gonna hire a tutor. This tutor knows English, history, philosophy, math, uh, political science, art, design, topography, or the Mensa math genius. Who do you want to tutor you? The math genius. Okay, you have to hold it close. The to math you. genius. The math genius. And why is that? Because um, they know more, I guess, about the topic. They know it inside out, upside down, they do it in their sleep, right? Yeah. They've seen this problem probably 1,000 times. Right? They've seen it a thousand times. How many times has a generalist seen it? One time. Okay? 
Um, there's another way to look at this. Uh, Alan Dibb in his book, um, The One Page Marketing Plan, The One Page Marketing Plan, it looks like pimp, but it's not. It's the one page marketing plan, Alan Dibb. He says, look at it like this. Let's say you have $10,000. You have $10,000 for a marketing budget, okay? You have $10,000. If you had to acquire or market to 10,000 clients, <clears throat> what's your budget per client? $1. $1, you're pretty good at math, $1. <laughs> so if it's 1,000, same thing, how much is it? A dollar, or what do you mean? Oh, ten dollars. Sorry. Yeah, ten dollars. Good. Okay. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to get a refund on the LMU. <laughs> okay. You got a hundred. What would it be? A hundred. Okay. Let's say you had to get ten clients. A thousand. Yeah. Okay. So this is the power of focus, and it works both ways. One is we have to hire, and then we have to spend. It works both ways. So if you had to market to 10 people and you had the budget of $1,000 per client, I bet you could come up with a lot of creative ideas. And I bet if you had to market to 10,000 clients and your budget was $1, you would say, dude, what am I gonna do with a dollar? What can that buy me per client? Hmm. And unfortunately, um, is it Alyssa? Are you Alyssa? Yes, with Alyssa. She's like, yeah, I have these clients, it's $100. I can't do anything. My hands are tied, man. I could barely like, get out of bed for that. So this is the power of focus. So if you focus on a few things, you'll have much better results. So it's just potency, the same thing. If you've seen a problem a thousand times, you kind of almost know the answer already. The generalist versus the specialist. Now I can tell, because I read faces for a living. <laughs> You're not convinced, Diego. Tell me why you're not convinced. Uh, do you think that maybe that focus could cloud you to new ideas or yeah. like new for sure. ways to achieving something? Yeah. So this is all that's new right here. And that's new, that's new, that's new, that's new. I love this. Oh my God, this is so, oh, what's this over here? We call that shiny object syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. It's so shiny over there and I'm bored of this. So, guess what? Have you ever tried to get good at anything that you don't know? Like what? Um, composing. Composing music? Yeah. Great, you tried it one time. Here, I'm done. I'm as good as I need to be. And then, whether you like his music or not, um, maybe Hans Zimmer, you know, he's worked on it for a while. It's the same thing. It's like we get distracted. So Blair Enns talks about this. You guys know who Blair Enns is? I'll write his name here for you guys, Blair Enns. He says that uh, creative people have an addiction. We do. I mean, not just the drugs, but to the new, <laughs> the novel. We tire of doing the same thing over and over and over again, right? So this addiction to the new and the novel actually work against our ability to market ourselves, to develop expertise and command the greatest value for our efforts. It really does. Now there are some places where the generalist is the preferred way to go, but there are only a few versus the many. And now I'll ask you this question, okay? Um, you guys are hungry. You guys go to the food court at the mall, right? And you go to the food court and you're, you're really hungry and you're feeling like you wanna have a great a uh, barbecue rib, let's just say that's what you want. So chances are you're gonna go to the smokehouse that does the barbecue ribs. But what about this amazing new food court vendor? They have a little Chinese food, a couple of ribs, they've got Korean, they've got Mexican, they've got Indian, they've got Middle Eastern food, they've got all American. It's like, how often do you go to that person versus the person who's focused on this? Like, do you want your hot dog vendor to make you sushi? And do you want your sushi vendor to give you hot dogs? I don't know. I don't think so. The only <laughs> time you go to the all-you-can-eat people, right, the hometown buffets, is when you're either super hungry and you're super indecisive. 
And no offense to Hometown Buffet. I've never even been there. Anybody Hometown Buffet fans? All right, there goes our sponsor. Um, and you just don't care about the quality of food you eat. That's it. It's harsh. You guys uh, watch that uh, film, uh, the Netflix documentary, I think. Not Netflix, it's a documentary. It's called Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Some of you have seen it. It's amazing. I didn't think I would like a movie like that, but I watched it. I'm like, dang, this is amazing. I went from, like, I don't like you to, like, I respect you, master. Okay? <laughs> in, in 90 minutes. Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Okay? Jiro is regarded as the world's greatest sushi chef. He lives in Japan. He's got a tiny sushi place. I think there's nine people by appointment only. Six month wait line time. It's incredible. And Jiro is meticulous about the amount of preparation that he puts into everything. Like he has people hand massaging squid or octopus for like hours. And that's all they do. You have to work for him for seven years before you're allowed to even cut a piece of fish. It's intense, and his son works for him, and there's this conflict that unfolds in the narrative. And he's just sitting there, and they're just doing this, and their hands are just beat up, massaging the octopus. And Jiro has this philosophy. He's like, people like eating octopus because it's very chewy. It's because they haven't eaten the, the octopus the way it's been prepared properly. It's you break down all the muscles and the tendon and whatever, and then it just melts in your mouth. He said that his greatest dream and what he, his legacy is he wants to be able to do the same thing the same way forever. And he knows it's not possible because they're so meticulous. They, they mix seven kinds of grains of rice together. They toast all the, the nori paper like moments before you eat it. And everything is done. And he pays for the most expensive thing. He tries to do everything the same way. And when I first heard him say that, I'm like, oh my God, just kill me now. But what he was saying was, he has such an impossibly high standard of food prep and delivery. His greatest goal in life is to make sure he maintains that level of quality. And that really blew me away. You know, before you um, eat there, he asks you questions. How tall are you? Are you left-handed? Are you right-handed? How much do you weigh? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, right? Like, why would you need to know that? Because when he serves you the fish, if you're left-handed, he puts it on your left-hand side. He arranges the plate differently depending on who you are. And how big you are changes the proportion of the fish and the rice he gives you. It is incredible attention to detail. So to be the greatest at something, I had to start to think, you've got to do it a lot of times to a very high degree. So we have to get rid of this desire to do so much because it works against us. Uh, Jordan Peterson talks about this. He's like, creative people are amazing, create immeasurable value in the world. And he talks about the Sistine Chapel and how much commerce that's made. And there's studies about how much revenue the Eiffel Tower has made for France and, and merch and souvenirs, not even just tourists. It's crazy. It's like a, over a billion dollars. That's what the power of art is. But he said that we are by nature divergent thinkers versus convergent thinking. And this works against our um, like success in the, in the world of finance and business because we're scatterbrains. So if we exercise a little discipline, we pick a lane, we can probably do really well for ourselves. So I'm going to tell you something that hopefully won't make you want to jump off a bridge after this, which is this, is that you probably should specialize externally, okay, while you remain a generalist, Internally, this is the critical difference. Like I said, I've prepared this argument many times before. Okay, what is what I mean by this? To the world, you are the greatest math problem solver, whiz kid, graphic designer. That's what they know you for. Inside, you're composing music, you're studying photography, you're writing poetry. We don't even care. We don't need to know. Here's the cool part. Here's the really cool part. When you get so much work and opportunities from this, this is one form of bias, okay? If you, do you guys know of the halo bias? I started looking into cognitive bias. Have you heard of the halo bias? It's pretty cool. So there are hundreds of kinds of bias, prejudice that we all have, shortcuts that we make about things to explain the world, because mostly it takes up too much energy to think about things. The halo bias is, if you're good at one thing, you must be good at everything. It really is true. And 
Let me show you how this works. You guys are young. You're still good looking. You walk into an interview. And they're like, damn, Diego's fine. <laughs> I bet you he's really good at logo design. And you just get by because you're good looking. You ever notice that? Okay, if you're good at doing logos, they're like, I bet you he could design websites. He's really that good. This happens all the time, okay? You see somebody who's smart at one thing, you just assume they're smart at everything. This works the opposite. God, he sucks at logo design. He must suck at web design too. God, he is ugly, he must be terrible at everything. This is what happens. So when you show the world just one thing that you're really good at, they just assume you're good at everything. And I have examples too, and I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so what happens is, you got so good at this, they're like, Diego, we're working on a new movie. Can you write the music for us? So other opportunities open up over here. Once you've established this superstar status, and to remind you, I just draw a star. Okay? Once you achieve this level of fame or expertise, credibility, then they start asking you for all kinds of stuff. So people hire me for all kinds of things I'm not qualified to do. I don't know if you know that. So I was working with a client and I was designing their identity system. Started talking about their brand a little bit. Next thing I know, the client hires me to design their facade, the signage, which is still close to what we do. And then they're like, Chris, can you design the inside? And I'm remodeling this building and these properties. Can you also design that? And I tell him, uh, and I say to him, you know, I'm not an architect. He goes, I know, I know. I'll hire an architect. You just do the concepts. So I get to do the best part of being an architect without the tedious work. It, it would suck to be that architect. And that's exactly what happens. I design these things in Illustrator. I render them in Cinema 4D. When I say I, Somebody here who knows how to use it. Renders it in Cinema 4D. The client approves it. It's wonderful. Later on, he shows me a picture. I never have to deal with like, oh yeah, move that over there and like try these things. It just worked. And I got paid to do that. Isn't that wonderful? I got paid to be a consultant for virtual rea reality experience. I didn't even know what that is. And I told him, I don't know how to do that. Like, but you know how to tell a story? I'm like, yeah. Okay, I'll do it. Just pay me and I'll do it. No problem. Internally, I'm studying philosophy, I'm looking at psychotherapy, I'm looking at typography, I'm looking at lots of different things. I don't put that out there all the time. This makes me richer internally, this makes me rich externally, meaning money in the bank. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. So don't throw yourself off a bridge. <laughs> you can still love all those things that you like to do. You can, just pick a lane and go deep on that and put that face into the world because the halo bias works for you, it also works against you. Now here's the rule. Many of you guys are going to get out of school in a few months. When you put out your portfolio, edit out all the garbage. And I promise you right now, because your program is not that focused, there's a little bit of garbage in there. Just take it out. Don't get this idea that you have to have 14 pieces. You need three. I said it, you need three. I got my first job in advertising by sending four pieces in a FedEx box. I was offered a job. I did it because my portfolio was not advertising base. So I picked four pieces that might feel like advertising, that was conceptual, and that's it. Got hired because of that. So some of the things that you think are true are not true. It's not the quantity, because what they do is they look at the worst piece and they imagine the rest of your work like that. If you could put that piece in your portfolio, I wonder what you're gonna do to us. So don't put anything that you're not super proud of and be merciless, be vigilant in what you keep. If you walk into an art gallery and you see three amazing pieces on the wall, that's all you need to know. You walk in a gallery, a couple of crappy pieces, like what are they thinking? The whole credibility of the gallery goes down. Okay, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. All right, what time is it and how many more questions do we have? 857, okay. So, um, one more and we're done, or, or was that the last one? Thank one you. more, you got it? Yes. Take us home. It's a lot of pressure. Okay. <laughs> You're like, no, it's not. Yeah. It's fine. Um, okay, my name is Jane. J 
Jane? Jane. Okay, perfect. Right. Jane. Uh, so my question actually comes from a comment you were making at the start of this where you said you make a lot of videos, but people don't care unless the audio is good. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you apply that to design at all, if there's an element in design that you notice that if that's the weakest link, everything just comes crashing down. Kind that's of. an excellent question. Okay. So we know that this is an... I feel like I must have put this in the wrong spot because I can't get over here. That a video is an audio visual experience, right? That most of us are visual people. We're in the design space. So we tend to focus on the visual a lot. What I learned years ago was an interview. I was No audio delay. Okay. Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm back. All right. All right, we're back. All right, thank you. It's a live show. These things happen. Okay. It's an audio visual experience. And when I heard George Lucas say this, he's like, when the audience comes to the screen, all they care about is what it sounds like. You guys know THX? That's George Lucas's uh, technology, you know that? Not that he invented it, but the, people, the scientists, the engineers, and the wizards. And you, when you go to watch a Star Wars film, it is on a new level, or on another level than most films. Today, films have caught up to that, but there was a time in which you would listen to the way that the, the bikes would race past you, and it was incredible. So he's like, they don't show up for the picture, they show up for the sound. So here's what we make. If this is the part that people care about, this little pit in the olive, we focus on that olive and make sure that that's fine because without that, they don't care about this at all. So when you make a piece of design, you have to figure out what does my audience or my client care about? And hopefully they're the same things. What does the client and the audience care about? What's going to move the needle? What's going to make an impact? And then solve for that problem because everything else is not, not important to solving this. Once you nail that part, everything is fine. So in your classes, your professors might say, concept. That's what people care about. You know? And I think that's true. That I would rather have something that looks ugly, but really be powerful and conceptual, than something that's beautiful and empty. Although I like both. Ideally, those two things are right here. So you have the beauty and you have the concept. And it's right there. That's the sweet spot. That's the stuff that people take notice of. So I would tell you or advise you just to look at what people care about. And they're not always what you care about. Some clients don't even care about the quality of the work. They don't. Some just want to make sure you hit the deadline. That's all. That's their status. Like, if you hit the deadline, you're good. Some clients might care because of cost. And you want to make sure you're on the same page. Or do we care about the same things? If you don't, and that bothers you, don't take the job. But once you understand that, you have to prioritize that. As you get more experience, become more well-known, you get to decide then what you care about, and they hire you because you care about that thing. It's not always the case at the beginning. Sometimes it is. When you get out and you're already a superstar, it can happen. Is anybody here a superstar already? Because it, it does happen. Anybody got a giant social following? Okay, I'll tell you a little story. I think seven, eight years ago, I had an intern here, and she had a pretty big social following on Instagram, and she was interning for me. It made me feel very insecure. I'm going to tell you, I'm like, damn, my intern has more followers than me? Not by a little bit, but by a lot. I checked recently. I'm okay now. But for a while, I was like, this is weird. And so sometimes, especially, I want to call them kids, but like 15-year-olds are already starting to do design work now. So by the time they get into college, they already have a lot of experience. 
And they've already built up a following, which is incredible to me. It's like what's happening in the poker world, you know, where these old timers are getting displaced by internet stars. And what is happening? Because they play online. So they play hundreds or thousands of hands versus like in the real table, it takes time to play a hand. And they have six, seven, eight tables playing at the same time. They're boop, boop. So they, they put in the mileage. And so when they show up on the scene, people are like blown away how good they are and how fast they got there because they've been able to experience that. Did I answer your question, Jane? Yeah, 100%. 100%? 100%. That's really good. That's like an A. Okay. Well, if I did 100%, I'm going to end it on a high note before something else breaks. So I, I want to thank you guys for coming out here, for asking the questions. I know we only hit, I think, four or five people. Uh, if you want to know more about what it is that we do, I would strongly encourage you to check out our channel. It's the future. Uh, and you can find us on YouTube. We have created over a thousand videos, believe it or not. And we're just getting started. So if you want to know more about pricing and value-based pricing, tons of content there. If you want to know how to deal with those really nasty clients, we do a lot of live role plays and we address those. So those are some of our most popular videos. Okay. And we also produce like how to design stuff, but it's not really what we spend a lot of time thinking about. How was this for you guys? We're still rolling, so it's okay. How was this for you? Is it okay? You guys going to see me on the street, that mother, <laughs> mother trucker. It's okay. The last class, they're like, yeah, whatever. And then they left, and they told Dave I sucked, and that was it. <laughs> you can tell me to my face if I sucked. I appreciate that. It's okay? Yeah. All right, great. Okay, well, that's it then. You guys, thanks for t tuning in live, and we will see you guys tomorrow live at 4 p.m. We're going to talk about how to grow your Instagram following. This is the follow-up. We're going to level two, so if you enjoy that one, make sure you tune in tomorrow at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and that's it. And Jonah, take us out of here.